I, hi everyone. Um, I'd like you like to welcome you to one of the final sessions for the conference today. I hope you found it very informative uh, so far. My name is Teresa Vanderpost and I'm an education specialist at the Center for Addiction and Mental Health. And I want to welcome you to the presentation, zooming in to capture the big picture in transitions in care. So uh, you're very fortunate to have three presenters uh, uh, with us this afternoon. And so I would like to introduce uh, Amy Yang. And Amy is currently a recovery coach at the Center for Addiction and Mental Health. We also have Narjes Bayrahi and she is an addiction psychiatrist at the Center for Addiction and Mental Health. And she's also an associate professor at the University of Toronto. And a good friend of mine, we have Tiana Costa, who is currently a clinical pharmacist at CAMH, uh, which is also the Center for Addiction and Mental Health. So um, just to let you know, um, if you have any questions throughout the presentation, please add your questions to the chat as we go through and we'll get to them when we do the Q&A at the end of the session. So I am going to uh, pass it over to Amy to start the presentation. Yeah, thank you so much, Teresa. Um, on behalf of the team, we really want to thank you for joining us as we zoom in to capture the big picture and transitions of care. And thank you for joining us on a Friday afternoon. So this program hasn't received any financial or in-kind support nor do we have conflicts of interest to declare. The learning objectives of this presentation is to, one, define transitions of care and highlight the importance in patient outcomes. Two, identify opportunities to initiate OAT in patients with an opioid use disorder. Three, Describe the role of collaborative care to promote a successful uptake of interventions and navigate complex care plans. Last but not least, to demonstrate the importance of connecting patients to addiction-specific support. So to better conceptualize how the idea of this presentation came about, we first want to introduce you to our team, Intensive Recovery Discharge Team. We're very lucky to work in a very heavily interdisciplinary team. We have two psychiatrists, a pharmacist, a nurse practitioner, and two recovery coaches, a social worker and occupational therapist, which is me. So we are a discharge team in that we follow clients immediately after they have been discharged from the medical withdrawal service and other acute care units at CAMH. We are intensive in that we follow clients uh, for two weeks, two to three times per week, where we provide phone, video, or in-person appointments, whatever works for the client at the time. We provide motivational interviewing sessions, addiction psychiatry follow-up, relapse prevention and management sessions, pharmacoeducation, and care coordination. Since its inception 14 months ago, we have serviced over 400 patients. And for quality improvement purposes, client feedback about their experience and service utilization is being reviewed. What I find really meaningful about our team, IRDT, is that we are dedicated to providing smoother transitions of care. We provide family sessions whenever possible and try to engage in case conferences with community providers as well. Thanks, Amy. So before we get into the meat of the presentation, we really wanted to define what a transition of care is. And so the WHO defines transitions of care as the various points where patients move to or return from a physical location or makes contact with a healthcare professional for the purposes of receiving health care. This can include transitions between home, hospital, care settings, or consultations with different healthcare providers in outpatient facilities. And what we really want to highlight is that people are most vulnerable during these care transitions. Care transitions can really threaten patient safety as they can increase the possibility of losing critical clinical inf information, and it really does require an increased degree of coordination. 
There are many different elements of care transitions, and I'm not going to go through all of these, but this is really what we're going to kind of go through in the presentation are the various elements in which uh, a provider can intervene or at least help smooth the transition. So the first being medication management. We want to ensure that patients and their families understand the use of their medication, how they're supposed to take it, where they're going to get it, why they're taking it. We also want to ensure that we have a plan and process in place in order to facilitate a safe transition from when a person is moving from one level of care to another. We really want to engage the patient and their family to enhance their participation in their own health, including making informed decisions. It is essential to provide proper communication as well as transfer of information, both amongst the patient and their family, but also with the care teams involved. Follow-up care, again, is hugely essential when we're looking at care transitions. We need to make sure that patients have this follow-up care within uh, an adequate time frame to ensure that nothing gets missed along the way. Finally, we want to ensure that there is healthcare provider engagement and shared ac accountability across providers and organizations. We know that transitions of care are recognized as very high-risk scenarios. Studies have shown that poor transitions of care can lead to increased morbidity and mortality, as well as adverse effects, delays in, in receiving appropriate treatment and community support. It can result in patients having additional primary care visits or emergency department visits, additional or duplicate tests that are ordered, or even tests that are ordered and completed but not necessarily followed up on, preventable hospital readmissions, one of the most concerning is emotional and physical pain and suffering for patients, their caregivers, and families. And finally, patient and provider dissatisfaction with care coordination. And I'm sure that many of you in the audience can think of a time when a person was leaving hospital and really the care transition was just not ideal. There wasn't that timely follow-up or you didn't receive the information in time. Thank you for letting us know about what transition of care is and why it's so important. Next, we're gonna look at transition of care through uh, the study, case study of Casey and do so in two different scenarios. So Casey is a 50 year old male who has no dependents and is supported through Ontario Disability Support Program, which essentially is a provincial program that provides financial support as well as other benefits for Ontarians with significant disability. He lives alone in a rental apartment. Casey has a diagnosis of opioid use disorder and recently had a period of three month sobriety following the completion of a residential program. Since then, uh, Casey has attempted Narcotics Anonymous several times, but didn't find it helpful because he didn't identify with the 12 steps, even though the residential program that he completed was based on the 12 steps. So Casey presented to the eMERGE with his son. He reported to the team that he is currently on the waiting list for another residential program, as well as for case management. Casey reported to using approximately one gram of fentanyl IV daily, um, with last use being approximately eight hours ago. Past medical history include opioid use disorder and no medication at admission. The triage nurse noted the following. Casey's vitals were stable. There were no signs of sedation or respiratory distress. No withdrawal symptoms were present and Casey was sitting very comfortably in the lounge. Casey, um, given his presentation, he was given the option to go home and to present to a nearby RAM clinic or to come back to the eMERGE when they were starting to experience withdrawal symptoms. Casey felt very frustrated and angry by this and decided to leave the eMERGE. On his way out, he briefly met with the allied help who can be social worker or occupational therapist. In this brief visit, um, the allied health focused on strategies to enhance the patient engagement element of transitions of care. So first, um, the contact information on chart was confirmed. Then a very simple yet practical question was asked. Can we leave voicemails? 
what we find sometimes is that the clients don't necessarily have voicemails or don't check it often or say that for whatever reason, um, they don't check, like what I said, yeah, they don't check it or they don't have it. So this question of asking, can we leave voicemails provides an amazing opportunity for us to discuss the importance of having an active voicemail. As well, the handouts for RAM clinics and for community and online resources for addiction and mental health were provided. With safety planning, warm line and distress lines were provided to Casey for him to follow up should he need them. And in certain cases, this can be also done with the app called Hope by CAMH, which I can discuss later on. But first, I want to draw our attention to warm lines. Whereas people know about distress lines, typically warm line isn't as well known. It is a line that people can call when they are feeling lonely, dis lonely, tired, or just in need of talking to someone, but don't necessarily feel that they are severe enough to uh, use the distress line. When I talk about uh, the distress lines and warm lines, typically I like to set the expectation clear by letting them know that depending on the call volume, it may take some time for them to be connected with a responder. As well, I like to kind of encourage clients to try using these before they actually need to use it so that they can gather more information from um, the person that they're talking to, which can reduce the barrier to them actually using the service when needed. What's really exciting is that there is a readily available and readily accessible list of distress and warm lines that is categorized by the Canadian city. And this can be found in under the resource section in Hope by CAMH. So what exactly is it? It's a free app that was created by CAMH as a suicide initiative, suicide prevention initiative. Um, what I really like about it is that it has a list of coping strategies under my safety plan. And these are categorized by how a person may be feeling at the time. So for instance, uh, the categories may read, my emotions are out of control right now, or I'm feeling too overwhelmed. So with this list of coping strategies, people can select the ones that they think would be most useful to them. And that would be saved under a safety plan and they can update it as they go. And engaging in this can provide an opportunity for our clients or any individuals for that matter, to develop um, and apply the coping strategies, especially with as it applies to relapse prevention and management. Thank you, Amy, and thank you, Tiana, for the presentation so far. So let's summarize what has happened for Casey. As we, you heard about the scenario, Casey left the emergency department unhappy because he was not in sufficient withdrawal. We didn't start any opioid treatment and we did basically nothing for opioid withdrawal management. He received some information and some education, but the discharge planning didn't change meaningfully. As a result, he's lost to follow up and he's no longer in engaged in treatment. Going back to what Tiana presented as element of care transition, let's see what is missing. One of the most important element of care transition is patient engagement. To be able to put this in context, let's put ourselves in Casey's shoes. Imagine that you are Casey. You, you are using fentanyl IV. Every morning when you wake up, you have cravings and you have fears that you are going to go to withdrawal. So you spend a couple of hours having access to fentanyl, trying to use IV, and the rest of the day is going to be intoxication. When Casey came to emergency department, he told you that he has used fentanyl eight hours ago. And he knows that he's going to accept 
expect to go through withdrawal in 12, 15 hours. So now that he is leaving the emergency department, he is in need to have access to fentanyl to be able to use it. If not, he's going to go through very unpleasant withdrawal symptoms. This is a study that presents a survey from emergency department physicians across Canada. And the sad part of the story is that scenario one, what we presented for Casey, is a very common scenario in our emergency department. In this study, they asked the physician about their common current practice of opioid use disorder management in emergency departments. When you look at the result, you can see that opioid treatment and withdrawal management rarely happen in our emergency department. Even referral to, for example, addiction treatment is not happening always. Safety planning also most of the time is not happening when you are looking at take-home naloxone. The conclusion of this study is that what we are doing in our emergency department are not aligned with the Canadian guidelines on the management of opioid use disorder. What emergency department physician value is transition of care. They like on-site on supports, including care coordination, addiction consult services, as well as timely and easily available outpatient care for patients with opioid use disorder. Comprehensive treatment of opioid use disorder consists of medication treatment, psychosocial planning, and psychological intervention. And all aspects of this management plan needs transition of care. I'm going to pass the conversation to Amy, who is going to present the psychosocial treatment. Yeah, thank you so much. So the common therapeutic goal of the psychosocial treatments is to modify the underlying process that maintain or reinforce uh, use behavior to encourage engagement with and uh, adherence to the treatment plan and to treat any concurrent psychiatric disorder that may either complicate a substance use disorder or to act as a trigger for relapse. The psychosocial treatment component should include the following, one being assessment of psychosocial needs, counseling, linkage to existing support, pro support systems, and referral to community-based services. So I want to take this opportunity to um, engage in a discussion and see what your thoughts are. And Mary, thank you so much for bringing up an excellent point that individuals who are homeless or in shelters do have limited self service resources that may um, be, act as a significant barrier to them using a lot of these services. So if anybody else has any like, um, strategies to kind of navigate that, please do type it in the chat because it's a great opportunity for us to share our resources. And while we do that, I guess another question that I have for you is what kind of psychosocial resources have you been sharing with patients with OUD? And what have the patients found particularly helpful? Maybe um, please do post in the chat as we go along, but with the thought of the holistic um, approach to OUD. Let's next, a lot of harm reduction psychoeducation from Emerge, good. Um, patients in my respect program find continued support with their primary care provider or caseworkers or even ODSP worker helpful in connecting with psychosocial resources, amazing. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing that. CMHA, MetaFee handouts, counseling resources, Wobot. I haven't heard about Wobot, so I'm going to write that down. And in terms of um, MetaFee, I think we're going to talk about RAM Clinic, so kind of related, and Tiana will talk about that also. And please do continue typing in the chat. Um, so yeah, we want to now look at a different scenario for Casey, where um, he does have an opportunity to liaise with a pharmacist and allied health for a little bit more in depth of a discussion. 
So as a reminder, Casey's a 50 year old male who is single with no dependents, is supported through Ontario Disability Support Program and has a diagnosis of OUD. He's had a period of three months abstinence following the completion of a residential program, tried Narcotics Anonymous, didn't agree with the 12 steps, is on wait list for residential program and for case management services. Casey had met with a triage nurse who noted like uh, stable vitals, no signs of sedation or respiratory distress, no uh, withdrawal symptoms. And like what I mentioned earlier, Casey met with the pharmacist and allied health to discuss options for OAT and psychosocial options. So in addition to the items that were discussed initially in case scenario one, there was further assessment of Casey's psychosocial needs, where though Casey was accompanied by his son to the eMERGE, he actually had very limited support and felt socially isolated. Boredom and lack of routine was identified as a major trigger, and Casey also reported that he had difficulty navigating the services. So with respect to his goals of increased community engagement, as well as mitigating some of that boredom by engaging in meaningful activities, we discussed getting connected to mutual health groups, as well to uh, confirm appointments and connection to supports. We targeted calling the case management as well as residential programs. So with case management, call the agency and um, make sure that he is still on the wait list and as well uh, make sure that they had the correct number on file. Because we do find that the wait list for case management, as essential as that service is, is sometimes very long, which means that people can oftentimes switch their numbers in between. So we updated the number and for residential program, when we called to verify his status on the wait list, found out that because Casey didn't keep up with the weekly check-ins that was necessary, he unfortunately lost his place on the wait list and had to be put back on again. Another strategy that was put in place was to have the son be an alternate contact. So what does that mean? That means that if the case management agency and the residential program have difficulty reaching um, Casey despite numerous attempts. In such a case, they can call the son um, to relay message about the appointment times, etc., to better coordinate these services for him. And these would be important for clients who often um, change their numbers frequently, lose their phones, or for whatever reason is unable to answer their calls, as well, other residential program options were considered. In terms of the mutual aid um, or mutual health groups, we discussed the social support that can be provided by it. So one that is very widely known is the 12 steps of uh, Narcotics Anonymous, etc. I'm not going to go through this slide in detail, but I just wanted to put it there for reference of the secular mutual aid groups like Smart Recovery, um, discussion forums like in the rooms. And again, if you know of more, please do type it in the chat so that we can all learn from one another. One keynote um, that I wanted to bring up is that librarians in public libraries can be an amazing resource. So in Toronto, we have a service called Book a Librarian, where you can book a librarian for 30 minutes to an hour, and they can help you with learning how to use Zoom, for instance. Other self-management online modules include Breaking Free Online, as well as Paying You. So Pain U it was created by the Toronto Academic Pain Medicine Institute, TAPME. And these are modules to help manage chronic pain. So not necessarily targeted toward um, opioid, people with opioid use disorders, but for those with chronic pain, but also can be helpful for our clients as well. And next we'll move on to the poll questions. Thank you, Tiana. <clears throat> yeah, thank you so much, Amy. So you really highlighted the different ways to engage patients and their families once leaving.
leaving hospital. And so when we looked at scenario one, Casey was told to leave the hospital because he wasn't in sufficient withdrawal and was told to follow up at a RAM clinic and in this instant didn't. So in this next scenario, he's given the option of, you know, ways to start OAT. And so the first polling question I wanted to ask is uh, for those who practice in the emergency department, how do you guys normally start buprenorphine naloxone? And so there might be many different ways that you do it. And just if you want to click the most common one. So a traditional induction, you start uh, when they are in withdrawal in the eMERGE, you give them a prescription for a take-home induction or a take-home micro-induction, or do you not start suboxone or buprenorphine naloxone in the ED? Um, so most people, I guess, have clicked that they start a traditional induction. So we know that opioid agonist therapy is a first-line treatment for opioid use disorder, and it is more effective than treatments that do not include opioid agonist therapy. So it is really important um, to be able to start opioid agonist therapy in the emergency department. Um, and in terms of why in the ED, ED might be that primary source of medical care for those with an opioid use disorder. And we know that ED visits offer an opportunity to access life-saving treatment and OAT in and of itself is life-saving treatment. So it really is a, an amazing place to access. Studies have also shown that ED initiated buprenorphine with facilitated transitions to outpatient care leads to better out health outcomes and is cost effective. So I really want to highlight kind of the ways in which we can make this more manageable from the ED to home and then to the RAM clinic. So when Casey met with the pharmacist, he was given the two options of a traditional home start or a microdosing start. Because he wasn't going to go into withdrawal anytime soon, the team felt that he could do this at home. And so um, there's different pros and cons of doing either start method. And I'm not going to go through it just because it's not in the scope of this presentation, but I have hyperlinked information through the Medify website, and I will be providing a lot of resources from Medify just because they have so many great options. Um, but with the traditional home start, uh, Casey would be told to go home, wait until he's in withdrawal, and he would be given a prescription to start the buprenorphine at home. Um, the patient information sheet would give him really detailed guidelines of what exactly he should expect, when to take what, uh, and if he has any questions where he can address those. Microdosing would be another option where uh, Casey would get a prescription of buprenorphine in small doses that he would take each day, um, and that would increase slowly. Um, this would offer the advantage that he doesn't have to be in withdrawal, and so that is usually, uh, or that could be an advantage that people are particularly interested in. And again, either option, he would be provided with a patient information sheet uh, to provide that information. Regardless of which induction method um, Casey decided to go with, it's important that we remind all patients to take buprenorphine sublingually. We need to provide a discharge prescription based on the initiation method. So if he was going to do the traditional home start, a three-day prescription is often sufficient versus if he was going to do the microdosing start, seven days would be more optimal. If there is time and if there's a pharmacist in the eMERGE that's able to help you with this, um, we also encourage calling the pharmacy to confirm that they've received the prescription and confirm any outstanding details. So sometimes, you know, patients don't have a health card. And so just naming that up front for the pharmacy, giving them any information that they may need could also be extremely helpful. Um, providing a handout on buprenorphine treatment. As I mentioned, one of these key elements of care transitions is medication management. We want to make sure that patients have all the available information on the medication, um, and providing that in writing can sometimes be useful. Offering a naloxone kit and training and harm reduction resources. And then finally, having this plan to follow up. So again, starting buprenorphine in the eMERGE is going to have no value if we can't continue it. So like I mentioned, a huge fan of, of all of the Medify resources. And so I really wanted to highlight these here and again, have hyperlinked them all. So a really great way to help with that transition from the ED to the RAM clinic is 
uh, providing them with a discharge referral form. And on this form, you would be able to indicate, well, what was the reason that they presented to the ED? Did they present for something else? Was it an overdose? Was it uh, substance-induced psychosis? Was it presenting for their uh, withdrawal management? What medications were given in the ED? Which medications were they discharged with? And being specific, especially with the buprenorphine, did you give them a prescription to do a traditional start, microdosing, et cetera? Um, and then to highlight that not all RAM clinics will give the long-acting buprenorphine formulations. And so if that was started, uh, making sure you do call the RAM clinic in advance. I also saw in the chat box before um, access, accessing the digital front door. So for those who do have virtual RAM options, if that could be accessed prior to discharging the patient, uh, that would also be extremely uh, useful. So RAM clinics um, are available many different uh, locations across Ontario. And so Medify does provide an up-to-date list with hours of operations and locations. So just some key points I want to highlight that we really want to work with the client to establish a date for follow-up. So instead of just saying, okay, now you follow up at the RAM clinic, it's okay, on Tuesday at 9 a.m. you will show up to the RAM clinic and just providing those clear details. Uh, making sure that you are checking for updated hours, especially with the, the pandemic, hours have changed. Um, and then determine if there's a specific date when new assessments are done. Sometimes I will call the RAM clinic and actually book an appointment for them. So that's also uh, an option. Provide patients with a copy of the hours and location as well as contact information. So the more information they have, you know, th the better equipped they are to follow up. And then lastly, if you can provide them with a copy of a patient-oriented discharge summary or at the very minimum, a medication list, again, just equipping them for success once they leave the hospital. Yeah, so thank you. I'm glad that finally Casey had a decent transition of care plan. Now uh, we are going to have another polling question. The question is, what if Casey presents to you and you are his primary practitioner and he's looking for treatment options for opioid use disorder? So I want you to choose between these poll questions. What would you do for him? Select the best answer that describes your plan for transition of care. All of these options, A, B, C, and D, are examples of transition of care. So choose the one that is the best answer that describes your plan. As I can see, most of them, most of the answers are answer C, means determine readiness to engage in opioid use. Okay, so bringing back the discussion to our scenarios, uh, Brief counseling was something that happened in scenario one. Also in scenario one, our allied health tried to provide some educational material and discuss the available services. So scenario one covered A and B. What happened in scenario two was determined readiness to engage in opioid use treatment plus engaging in more collaborative care, and we try to start OAT and plan for transition of care. This is a study was tried to conceptualize transition of care in substance use disorder. As you can see here, transition of care could be from less intensive to more intensive. Example of less intensive would be just counseling and providing information. Going back to different element of care transition, think about information. For example, when you are passing information to another care provider, you can just write a note and fax it. The other thing is that you would be able to add another part to your notes saying that I'm trying I am transitioning the care. This patient had a previous consultation, psychiatric consultation. I will be happy also this, to share it with you. You can contact me with this number if you need further information. Uh, 
If you want to go further, you can mention that I'm hoping to contact you to be able to talk to you or to have a case conference with you present, also asking the addiction counselor patient to join of patient to join our case conference for care transition. When the transition practices are more intensive, the process outcome is better and the health, health outcomes are better. The process outcomes are increased knowledge of available resources, increased access to those resources, and increased engagement in treatment. And health outcome are less substance use and misuse, more days, of abstinence and better mental health functioning and quality of life of our patient. Now that we all know that transition of care is something that our patients will benefit from it, and we heard it since this morning from other presenters, so why this is not happening? There are barriers from patients' perspective. Some of them, I can give you some examples. For example, they had previous negative experiences with care providers, similar to what happened with, similar to what happened for Casey in our emergency department. Also, for those who is the first time treatment seekers, they may say, they may think that they don't need further support and the support that they have actually is enough, so they would be able to manage by their own. It's good to know that not all addiction support is OHIP covered, and most of our patients don't have coverage for those. We have long wait time for a lot, of, for example, they are booking an assessment for residential treatment in four months. Stigma could be a big barrier. Our patient may don't know that there is what kind of support is available for them. The other barrier would be the low psychosocial support. For example, having difficulty with homelessness or uh, other difficulty in so psychosocial aspect may limit their access and low motivation could be another barrier. There is also, there are also barriers from care provider perspectives. We may don't have enough knowledge about what's the available and what's the efficacy of treatment options available. We may have also our own negative perception and stigma toward addiction. We may not have enough experience about communicating with different providers. Different care providers could be the RAM clinic doctor, could be addiction counselor, could be case worker, could be family members, could be intake coordinator of a residential program. We may have difficulty implementing a patient and family centered care. And probably we don't know when is the best time to refer the patient, why we should refer the patient, and where to refer our patients. So to summarize, our patients have different options about when to start, where to start opioid treatment. Could be in the emergency department, could be in inpatient unit, could be in primary care outpatient offices, could be in RAM clinic or in collaborative clinics. But it's not the only thing that they need in their care. They need psychosocial planning and all of these aspects, as I mentioned, it's care coordination involved. Addiction treatment is a collaborative care, means that we are not transferring care of our clients to other care providers. We are transitioning the care to our other to other care providers, means that we are going to remain connected to them. As conclusion, I want to say that every patient will benefit from optimal transition of care and it's essential to receive it. Key element of transition of care include medication, psychosocial intervention, case management and psychosocial support, 
and transition of care involve all healthcare professionals involved in the care team. We are very happy to hear about questions and have a discussion. Thank you. Um, I could just go over a few comments that were made during your um, your presentation. And uh, one thing is really impressive is the amount of um, psychosocial resources that everyone has provided to each other. There's some uh, links in there. Um, as Amy said, we'll all have to look into what Wobot is. Uh, somebody had comment commented that there is a, a web comic on one person's experience with Wobot that may be of interest to some people. So you can scroll through the chat. Um, a lot of other psychosocial resources uh, talking about recovery college, uh, breaking free online, um, uh, connects Ontario. And I think uh, Tiana had, you had been talking about uh, somebody had mentioned the digital front door. And uh, somebody's also mentioned uh, Dr. Andrea Furlan's YouTube channel is uh, fantastic um, uh, for explaining withdrawal pain, opiate uh, induced hyperalgesia and much more. Um, so there was one question in here. Um, someone was wondering if this program is available on weekends and in the evenings or just during business hours. I find that often people who use drugs do not want to go to the ED due to stigma. Do you meet with clients in the ED or elsewhere in the hospital or in an outpatient space? If one of you would like to take that on. I don't know if Amy, you are okay. I can answer this question. Yeah, so we, the way that patients are referred to our program because we are only a post discharge team. So they are referred from inpatient unit to us and they could also be referred from emergency department. And you, we are working business hours, but they, they would be able to leave a message for the recovery coach even over the weekend. Okay, great. Um, any, a uh, few other comments, we don't have any questions coming in yet, um, but uh, somebody had made a comment, I believe it was when you were talking about starting the OAT and the ED, and uh, somebody had mentioned that uh, patients can often start induction at home with take-home doses after reviewing the COW scale and follow-up phone calls. So I don't know if uh, one of you would like to address that a little bit further or, or uh, add any thoughts to that particular comment. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, when we start buprenorphine in our outpatient clinic um, and the patient presents not in withdrawal, we often will do that as well and then have, you know, pretty frequent follow-up calls um, and then the patient can come back to the clinic um, whenever they see fit. Um, in the ED, it's a little bit harder because you don't necessarily have those follow-up phone calls available, but that could be something, again, that would help improve that transition is just like having that bridge um, that connects them. But I mean, early uh, referral and, and I guess early entry into a RAM clinic would also uh, be a good idea just so that, that that patient has that frequent access point really close to discharge um, just to identify if there's anything going wrong, they haven't started it or whatever reason. Great. Um, oh, I um, see a comment just came in right now. Um, I recall you saying this is a two week transition program. Do you find that this is long enough? Uh, so that's part one of the question. And do you have people who continue to use your services say one month after they last saw you? I think no duration would be long enough to support our clients. I think there is some limited resources. And our goal is that sometimes, I think the keynote speaker talked about how recovery isn't necessarily about like abstinence in a sense, it's about how they define their recovery or how they define their use. Um, I may be just kind of like speaking on my personal opinion, but if it is that the client wants to continue using um, during the two weeks or afterwards, um, it is their recovery. Um, there are, and yes, there are people who do relapse during the two weeks, uh, but do wish to cut down their use or abstain. Um, maybe I can transfer the question over in a very smooth manner. <laughs> 
Yeah, I think that I agree with you. Always two weeks is not enough, but our mission is transition of care. So what we are doing is to help clients to connect to other resources in the community to facilitate collaborative care for addiction and Intensive case management is ideal and very effective, but also it's very co costly for healthcare. So those patients who can have access to intensive case management, definitely they are going to benefit from that. But for our service, we are doing for two weeks and we are based on our pre preliminary QI as feedback. This is very common that they are asking for more, okay? that two weeks is not enough and they were hoping to be more. But so far we are receiving very good feedback from our clients. Great. Tiana, did you have anything else to add or I'll move on to the next question? Yeah, no, we can move on. Okay, great. Uh, so uh, there was just one comment too that uh, someone found that speaking to a patient's ODSP worker uh, can be very helpful for the patient. Um, and we did have another question that, is there a common barrier or anxiety for clients that might surprise people? I guess, Nicole, I was just wondering what you were referring to, like uh, anxiety to our program or to initiating OAT or? Uh, she says, what are some, oh, wait a second here. What are some slam dunks for aiding people in their transition? Is it access to skills, medications, social? I mean, to be honest with you, it's it's all of the above. And I think like working with an interdisciplinary team, that's where you see it all. Um, just having that access to all of the resources. And so medications being one that that's quite important. And again, like making sure that they understand, making sure that they have access to the medication. But then, you know, Amy works a lot with our clients in terms of building those skills and identifying triggers. And, you know, when a slip or relapse happens and it's during our program, Amy kind of does, you know, an, an analysis of that, of what happened and, and what could be better next time. Uh, no. Uh, yeah. Because like one thing that we kind of need to remember is that it's like a it's a lot of skills that they're learning at the all at once while having to uh, manage other psychosocial stressors as well as like financial concerns. So relapses and like lapses do occur and our job wouldn't be necessarily to um, kind of like stigmatize about that, but rather like kind of focusing on, okay, what went right and how can we support you through it and help you as you continue to learn these skills. Um, and I just have a, an addition from Mary when she was asking you about the, the uh, two weeks uh, time. Um, she's just mentioned that she asked because she worked in a respite program, a transition program. We were working with a client with an acute medical problem, and they often have addictions as well as concurrent disorders. And we have difficulty transitioning them to the community. Um, any strategies specifically to the psychiatrist to mitigate this, the anxiety in being transitioned away from care, um, they're working with them for two to three weeks max. Yeah, this is a good question. So as we mentioned, transition of care is very anxiety provoking. When you are asking a person to call, go from one setting to another setting, to from one provider to another provider, it's very difficult and we don't have enough resources available too. We have to acknowledge that too. So it's not easy to find a psychiatrist seeing a patient. Uh, we know that. But what we can do is to just let them know that they can recall connect with you. For example, if he, if a family doctor is doing a referral, then knows that I'm going to follow up with this referral. So we can see if, when this is going to happen. Or for example, our recovery coach, when talking to a client, say, this is my extension. Try to use those skills. And if you have question about that, you can give me a call. So knowing that you would be able to come back and connect to where you have been referred is a good practice. The other thing that helps with the anxiety is that when two, two care providers are connected to each other. For example, when I am telling to my patients that I talk to your lab, RAM doctor, so it's a big relief. So knows that we have coordinated the care, we know what we are doing, and he's, he's, he knows what is going to expect to happen. 
Great, thanks, Nargis. Um, I have another question in the chat. Um, any strategies for improving transitions? Um, sorry, any strategies for improving transitions? Individuals released from correctional services and started on OAT, but not necessarily provided with anything when they are released. We end up, end up seeing them in ED with no collateral. Yeah, I mean. It would be great if people from correctional services were watching this because I think a lot of it's quite similar and a lot of these, you know, Medify resources can be used um, in terms of providing them with a discharge prescription and providing them just even with a list of RAM clinics, you know, near where they'll be staying. Um, but oftentimes when patients present uh, to our eMERGE with this situation, I mean, I usually call the correction facility, ask to speak with the pharmacy directly, and then I can get an, uh, the information on last dose and other medications. Um, not ideal, uh, especially if there's been a time lapse and you have to restart it anyways, but sometimes it can provide at least that collateral of what medications, what dose you might expect, et cetera. Uh, okay, we have just another general comment. Uh, I used to work in corrections for four and a half years prior to the respite center. You can always have the patient sign a release of info to get information from the pharmacy MD or NP, uh, just as an extra aside. Yeah, and I usually, I don't even get a release when I call, uh, just because it ends up being within the circle of care uh, to provide the information while the patient's in hospital. Okay. I think there was also a question, sorry. Um, how do we, um, I think a person, Bobby, asked how uh, people can get copy of the slides. Yeah, I was just, that was going to be my next question Thank to you, you, if any of you were aware of that or not. <laughs> Um, so do you, I, I'm not sure as the moderator um, um, how they get copies of the slides or if they're being provided. Um, so we can um, hopefully look into that. Maybe our tech person may know. Um, not sure what the protocol is for this particular conference. So Bobby, uh, we will uh, do our best to make sure somebody does let you know. Okay, so I think uh, we've got about three minutes left before wrap up. Um, so I just want to maybe take this time if there's no other questions that I can see in the chat, um, whether Narjas, Amy and Tiana, if you have some closing remarks, some uh, general takeaways that you would like to wrap up with and um, and we can go from there and um, uh, oh, our tech person just let us know that the slides are not being posted at this time, but recordings of the sessions will be up for review uh, by next week. So, um, uh, yeah, that's the update about the slides. So I'll throw it back to the three of you if you'd like to each say, you know, if you have a wrap up comment before we conclude for the day. Um, I just want to say thank you guys so much for spending your uh, Friday afternoon with us, mm -hmm. and I hope you all have a good weekend. Yeah, thank you so much for uh, engaging with us and sharing all of the resources so that can be a learning experience for us all. Um, I think I forget who commented, but they also brought up Connects Ontario. I can also type in the chat again. It is such a great um, resource uh, for, to look up day programs and other uh, substance use disorder and mental health resources. You can text it. Um, and whatnot. So just wanted to kind of emphasize that again. And so thank you so much for bringing that up. And thank you again for joining us. And thank you for participation and being so active in chat box and poll questions. And I want also to thank you for my amazing team, Tiana, Amy, and those who are not present. Thank you, ladies. It was a, a great uh, hour together. And um, I just want to take the opportunity uh, for everyone attending. Um, this is your last session. There is not a closing remark session. So this will conclude your day at the conference. Um, I hope you found the day extremely informative and uh, you know encountered lots of takeaways uh, for you. And um, happy Friday. Have a great weekend. And uh, all the best to everyone.